So today's session is all about the rules of the road as it pertains to Florida shellfish aquaculture. And we are doing that in this session because it's one of the topics that's been identified by the Cedar Key Aquaculture Association in terms of for the SALT program for the Cedar Key High School. This is one of the items that they specifically want the students to um, get more involved in with a presentation and better understanding. Some of the students have actually already gone out with Mark DeHaven and my, actually, I don't know if it was Mark, I think it was Mike Kuman to better understand uh, what's involved in our shellfish harvesting waters monitoring. And um, so we're not going to discuss a lot of the rules pertaining to public health um, this morning. That will still be another session um, during the school uh, timeframe. But there are many other rules and regulations that a shellfish farmer must abide by. And we're going to just start going through some of those. But to do that first, we're going to I'm not going down here. How am I moving forward? Give us a minute and we can try and, all right. So, all right, so what we're gonna quickly go on is some background. So better understanding of how Florida went from a state that had some of the most uh, oppressive aquaculture regs um, just a short 30 years ago to a state that has the, some of the most progressive rules and laws pertaining to aquaculture, not just shellfish aquaculture. Part of that is the aquaculture certification program, best management practices programs. And we're also going to touch base this morning about the leasing program and other requirements. So as a way of background, and for many of you sitting in this room, um, you weren't even born. So this is ancient history, sorry, but for some of us, we do recall, it wasn't that long ago. And I do wanna bring this up because I think Cedar Key um, is very, plays a, a key component to some of this background and how we moved forward with some very progressive laws and um, rules pertaining to aquaculture. So. Way back in 1994, and this was just the year after the first leases were let here in Cedar Key, uh, we had our House of Representatives in, in the Florida legislature. The chair was Bert Harris, and he brought all of his agriculture committee and his staff, and we put them on a pontoon boat, and we took them down the long navigational corridor at Gulf Jackson to watch people work in their farms and they were duly impressed. This was after fishermen were being put out of work uh, by a net ban. Um, also uh, prior to that, the results of Project Ocean where um, some of our oyster harvesters were put out of work by a fishery closure. So here they were able to observe folks learning a new way to do business on the water. So they started, um, and we also treated them to oysters and clams that afternoon. So they started thinking about ways that they could move forward in addressing some of the bottlenecks in um, aquaculture in the state. To do that, they set up a summer study the following year and they hosted several town hall meetings to get feedback from, from growers or folks interested in aquaculture from other state agency reps interested folks, researchers, faculty. One of those town hall meetings was actually held here in Cedar Key. And another way of background of, of getting our state legislatures more informed about aquaculture in Florida, our statewide organization began hosting some very popular registrations up in Tallahassee during the session. Those began in 1991. So there are our, our Senators and our representatives were able to meet with our farmers, eat fried gator, oysters on the half shell. It allowed for a really good interactive um, means uh, and for, again, our legislatures to better understand our needs. As a result, some important and monumental legislation was passed starting in 1996 where aquaculture was declared to be agriculture. That was very important up to that time aquaculture was only considered in state statute in regards to marketing. 
um, not in terms of it actually being an agricultural industry. The same Florida Aquaculture Policy Act um, identified shellfish aquaculture to be in the public interest. That was very important. Two years later, um, our lead agency um, was named to be within the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. That made sense since we're now at agriculture. Prior to that, the various aquaculture, excuse me, responsibilities were in several various state agencies and uh, one of them being um, the agency that handles natural resources. And then the following year, 1999, all regulatory responsibilities transferred to the new division of aquaculture. So you haven't been around all that long. I'm, in fact, probably going to get ready to have a 20 year anniversary. We should think about that. All right, let's talk about the aquaculture certification. Um, that's a very important piece of legislation we just uh, talked about. Um, what it does, it identifies the aquaculture farmer, it identifies their farm, and it identifies their products through a license or sort of certification of registration. You end up with your own AQ card. So what it does, there's some very important benefits to that. So what it does, it allows the aquatic growers the same benefits as agriculture producers. Most importantly now, now that you have your own AQ card and you're recognized as an aquaculture business, it allows you to be exempt from culture species, your, for example, your clams from resource management rules. And I'll give you a perfect example. Prior to this, all your farm clams had to be harvested at one inch across the hinge. That is the rule pertaining to natural resources. So if you want to take a rake and go out to the Indian River and rake up wild clams, they have to be one inch in size. Just think as a farmer what you would have to do to meet your market demand if you had to meet that natural resource rule, one inch. So. We did actually change that prior to 1996, working with the state resource agency then, but one of the biggest objections to changing that rule for minimum size was there was no way to identify the farm product or the farmer. Um, so now that you're a farmer and you're recognized as one, the question was, by the way, was there any maximum size? You harvest as the market dictates. You buy your own seed, you're putting them on your own farm site. It is the market that dictates what size you harvest at. So we have a few questions here that we were hoping folks in the room could try and answer. And if you take a minute here, Pete. Um, so pertaining to the aquaculture certificate or your AQ card, wanted to know if you knew how good one of the, how, what's the time period that uh, your AQ card is good for? If you know the answer, go ahead and write it down. How much is the annual fee um, for the card? Can someone other than a leaseholder get an AQ card? So again, um, to obtain an aquaculture certificate, you must have an aquatic facility. And since we're now applying this to shellfish aquaculture, we're gonna assume that if you have a lease that you're going to have to have your AQ card. So the question is, can somebody other than a leaseholder get one and what is an authorized user agreement? You got it, you know, have any of those answers there, Pete? Mm -hmm. Don't tell Portia that, we don't want them to know that you think it's $150. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's the anchor hole. Um, so if you have some ideas, if not, we'll get back with Portia and Charlie and we'll, we'll get some of these questions answered correctly. All right. Now, Pete, I think you did attain this. So in addition to, um, the fee and being a leaseholder in the case of a shellfish farmer, you are required also to take a annual educational training on shellfish. Um, I think you went to that this year? Did you go to that? It was here in the classroom? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, so so every year, um, somebody that's going to harvest shellfish, whether off their lease or if they're going to harvest wild oysters, um, they have to take this training. 
and it allows for up-to-date or current information on processing, handling, transportation as it pertains to public health and safety. And so with that certificate, then you can go ahead and renew or obtain your aquaculture certificate for the upcoming year. It must be a copy of the certificate. Somebody must have that on the boat at all times. And this must be done every year. All right, we're gonna move on to another program that is um, very beneficial to our aquaculture industries here in Florida. Um, and it's tied into your aquaculture certificate. So as an AQ holder for a shellfish lease or for a nursery or for a hatchery, you also have best management practices that are developed for that facility, specific facility. Um, they are rules, they are a living document, they are changed from time to time, um, whether there's new facilities like an aquaculture dock that is added to here, uh, to this book. Um, so again, as a certified aquaculturist, you go and find out what specific practices or rules are developed for that particular facility. So the BNPs consist of general or very specific instructions at time that address the construction, operation, and management of that facility. And the reason you're doing this is this then um, oversees all of the environmental rules and regulations. If you abide by your BNPs, and you have to as an AQ card holder, um, these address the various environmental issues that another state agency may typically take on. For example, for a land-based nursery, prior to these BMPs and an AQ certification, you would have to get a general discharge permit from the Department of Environmental Protection. You don't have to do that. You don't have to go to another state agency. Instead, you go to um, your seed or nursery facility and you find out what you must do to meet the BMPs and maintain those under your aquaculture certification. What, what the BMPs do not do is it doesn't uh, supersede any of the applicable federal or local uh, rules or regulations or authorities. For example, uh, U.S. Coast Guard. You must buy, abide by U.S. Coast Guard rules as it pertains to marking your lease. That's on a federal level. On a local level, if you're building an aquaculture dock, you still have to get a building permit or abide by local county or city rules as it pertains to that facility. So another important aspect of this particular program is that Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services staff, again, under the Division of Aquaculture, actually come out and do a site visit. I believe two, three, maybe four times a year. They may visit the land-based nurseries and hatcheries here in Cedar Key and make sure that that certified facility and user are abiding by those BMPs. And you must comply with those. If not, you do get a notification of that you're not in compliance and you have a certain amount of time to correct whatever issues there are. So these are enforceable. So let's take a look at some of the BMPs for clam seed, for clam leases, for mechanical harvesting, and for docks. So again, this is a Q&A. So for clam seed, there are BMPs under genetic protection. So the question is, what stocks can be used to plant clams on your shellfish aquaculture lease? Yeah. Okay, so it refers to, so can you just take stocks from New England and have your hatchery? Yeah. So that there are some BMPs that pertain that say you should use these stocks only for your seed stocks that you're going to purchase and plant on your lease. Yeah, you like Pardon? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So we'll we'll talk. We'll have um, Charlie and Portia talk a little bit more about genetic protection as well as health protection. So the question is, can you get seed from out of state? And if you can what documentation is needed to get that seed. Okay. 
All right, so BMPs for clam leases. So what license do you need to sell clams from your lease to be a certified, to, a, to sell to a wholesaler? Yes, that's the answer. What times can you work on your lease? Probably not. No, so we're going to go review that. So the, I don't know if, if they can't hear that. Can they hear his answer? Probably not. So Pete's answer to what times can you work on your lease was you got to be back by midnight. Hmm. We're going to have to work on that one. We're going to come back to all these Q and A's. Um, and uh, so all culture materials on your lease must be free of what? Okay. Food safe products, that's a good guess. And when you are through using CoverNet, what do you do with it? Dispose properly off the lease. They got this one right, Charlie. All right, BMPs for mechanical harvesting. And so this is a little tricky. Um, and I noticed when I took the test quiz on the Florida Aquaculture Association's website for the certification program, there was a question about mechanical harvesting. And um, these are some new BMPs uh, based on state legislation just a couple of years ago that allow for mechanical harvesting. So the question, first question is, can you use a mechanical harvester on your lease? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, the picture on the right there is not what we consider to be a mechanical harvesting. That is a pump driven or a hydraulic driven harvester. And so the next question kind of addresses that particular harvester. It says, what kind of harvester can be used to harvest bottom planted clams or Sunray Venus without a special lease condition? I know, uh, but we are going to distinguish between that. And then the follow up question would be, what kind of harvester will require special lease conditions? And we'll uh, look to Portia to clarify those two types of harvesters. No questions about aquaculture support docs here, but we can discuss it further. But again, this is um, also in the BMPs. And this came about, I believe in 2005, when uh, actually, I believe, uh, Cedar Key Aquaculture Association was certainly involved in seeking to get statutory authority for our state agency, our agriculture agency, to be able to oversee the use of state lands for docks, to, to be able to per, um, permit, if you will, docks or certify docks. Prior to that, any docks that were being used for aquaculture had to go through the Department of Environmental Protection um, and be permitted really almost as a commercial dock, as um, uh, almost like a marina, if you will, with a pretty high use fee for that as well. So this is where these two programs, your aquaculture certificate as well as your BMPs work very hand in hand to solve uh, obstacles associated with, in this case, shellfish aquaculture. So now you have a certified aquaculture facility, that's your dock, and you have specific best management practices that address construction, operation, and maintenance of your aquaculture dock. Aquaculture docks in Cedar Key are very important. This is the series of islands here. We don't have a lot of land. So the docks are very useful in terms of obviously mooring your work skiffs for loading and offloading um, product and your gear, as well as siting of land-based nurseries. So there, there again, there are specific um, BMPs associated with that and what the initial criteria for an aquaculture dock is it must be less than or equal to 2,000 square feet in a footprint. All right, let's move on to the leasing program. Um, again, ancient history here, but really for some of us, it's not so long ago that actually you could not obtain a lease in the state of Florida. There were no mechanism with which to go get a new lease other than what was referred to as the old shellfish culch leases that had been issued in perpetuity. But in 1988, um, we, again, through a law, there was a state statute that allowed for aquaculture leasing program, a new, brand new program. 
and it provided for the authority for leasing sovereign submerged lands, state-owned submerged lands for the purpose of shellfish aquaculture. Again, administered by um, uh, our Department of Agriculture, Division of Aquaculture, and in order to lease these lands, the clam grower or oyster grower enters into a lease agreement or a contract with the agency to do so. Uh, so the first leases to be let, so we have a, we have a law put into place in 1988. There, under that new law in the early um, 1990s, a few leases were let over in the Indian River Lagoon to facilitate that um, emerging clam industry over on the east central coast of Florida. It wasn't until 1993 that the first shellfish aquaculture leases were let here off of Cedar Key. And that was a result of those job retraining programs we talked about in a, a prior um, presentation that helped get the industry started here in Cedar Key. I don't know, I know that was way before you were born, but I don't know if you've heard your dad talk about that. No. So in order to place all these program graduates onto their new farms and their new businesses, we had to identify large tracts of submerged lands for, for that. And um, as opposed to having individual leases scattered throughout our inshore coastal waters, both the state agency at the time, that was Department of Natural Resources, our uh, local county government, as well as interested citizens and the program graduates themselves, participants themselves, agreed that we should block these leases together where they would meet the requirements for a lease. Um, the term was called high density lease area. It's now referred to as aquaculture use zone. And within that zone or area, then it would be, oh, I don't have that one picture in here, sorry. It would, but as you see in the lower bottom, they would be blocked out in the case here, Cedar Key, the majority of them are blocked out into two acre parcels. There's a 25 foot easement between the parcels as well as through some of the columns, you'll have navigational corridors of about 50 foot to allow for egress and ingress into the lease area by boat. Also these aquaculture use zones are named after an adjacent land or water mass, such as Dog Island. So we have a Dog Island lease area. Gulf Jackson was a misnomer. We thought that they were talking about the Gulf of Mexico. We didn't know what Jackson came from. That was the name that we decided. Come to find out later, it was named after a fisherman that used um, the waters where Gulf Jackson is located. His name was Gus. G.U.S. Jackson, and some of the local fishermen that helped identify these lease areas were saying that they should name it after Gus Jackson. But it, we didn't. So again, just briefly a little bit about some of the various um, requirements to cite a shellfish lease. They have to undergo a resource survey. In other words, there should be no existing oysters there or submerged aquatic vegetation. We actually had a lease area that was identified way back when that had way too many sand dollars and that was discounted as a potential lease area. Yeah, don't tell anybody that. Um, <laughs> so. Um, most importantly, they have to be located in waters that are approved for shellfish harvesting. And you know what that means, Pete? Yep. Uh, the water has to be tested. Yes, that has to be tested and it has to be approved or conditionally approved. And that's when you went out with uh, Mark Kuman. And I don't know if you went with him. No, yeah, yeah. Um, but some folks did go out with to on one of his sampling runs to see how the samples are taken, where they're taken, and the frequency of that, and what that all means. Um, there are many other criteria in citing a lease, some of them that you don't want to impede with navigation or other uses like crabbing or other type of fishing um, uh, opportunities. You don't want to be interfering with those activities by citing an aquaculture lease. And then finally, you start to think about what is needed for the animal that you want to culture. 
um, after you get through all those hurdles. And then for clams, you're looking for a certain salinity regime and substrate, substrate characteristics. Uh, so once you get through all that, then you get to a point where you identify those submerged lands that have the potential for uh, leasing. And again, if you look at some of the high density lease areas, do, both to the east and west of Cedar Key here. All right, so here's some Q and A's about your clam lease requirements. So what's the term of the lease? So how many years? What? One or two? Boy, do you think your dad would like to renew his lease every one or two years? No, no, okay. Are the leases renewable? They are. Can leases be transferred or subleased? Um, Pete responded he didn't know, but we, by the end of the session, he will. And then what are the annual clam lease rental fees? Yeah. Some more conditions that are defined in the lease contract between the, the shellfish farmer and Department of Agriculture are clam leases limited to the bottom use only. And, and note the operative word here was clam leases, not oyster leases, okay? Can you relay or move wild shellfish stocks to a lease? Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, really all right, we'll come back to that question. What is the minimum clam cultivation requirement? No clue. No clue, okay. And what information is required on the annual audit to, again, your agency? And who is responsible for marking the leases? You, There's, that's, you got that one right. We're gonna come back to the rest of these. All right, and, and here's uh, some information provided by DAX on how to mark those leases. As Pete said, it is the responsibility of the leaseholder to maintain the corner markers on their parcels there. And obviously within a aquaculture use zone, there are corner and perimeter markers as well with uh, the very large navigational sign you see there. On the post or buoys that mark the corners of a, let's say a two acre parcel here in Cedar Key that a farmer has, uh, the required um, language, if you will, or identification is the corner marker designation, northeast, southeast, southwest, southeast. Um, and then you have the choice of either putting the parcel number if you're within an aquaculture's use zone or the actual lease number. So the parcel number refers to like a street address where that particular piece of submerged land is located within an aquaculture use zone. So Parcel L617 tells you exactly where you are in the Gulf Jackson lease area, as opposed to the lease number 38AQ123, where 38 is the code for Levy County. AQ is an aquaculture lease, and 123 is specific to that lease holder, but it doesn't give you a clue as to where that lease is located. All right, here's our question and answer. We're gonna answer right now from the Department of Ag. So shellfish aquaculture leases, true or false? You will get in trouble if you are not a leaseholder and you're caught in possession of cultured clams or harvesting clams from a specific lease site. Yeah. Yes, true, that is true. Yep, so it is against the law for anyone other than the leaseholder to harvest cultured clams from lease areas. In fact, it's a third degree felony. Misdemeanor. misdemeanor. All right, you're going to have to correct me, Charlie or Portia. Um, if convicted, it's a $10,000 fine, and under the Florida Aquaculture Policy Act, you also then, your aquaculture certificate would be revoked. So that would basically put you out of business if convicted of stealing product off a shellfish aquaculture lease. All right, so here's a question for you, Pete. In terms of public health requirements, we're not going to go into this in detail. Um, this will be for another topic, another session, but molluscan shellfish, clams, oysters, mussels are the most highly regulated food protein in the United States because they're filter feeders. So as they're filtering in water, they can be taking in other than their food and oxygen, other contaminants that might be in the water. There's another reason. A lot of folks like to eat their mollusk 
their clams or oysters raw or partially cooked. So if you're harvesting uh, clams from a area that has a source of pollutants, then we end up with a health hazard. So in order to protect the public from eating um, molluscan shellfish, there is a host of requirements that are uh, um, start from a federal level, go all the way to the state level. And again, complex system, um, and this will be addressed at a later session, but some of the topics that we're not talking about today, but are again part of the very important rules of the road and need for understanding by a shellfish farmer is about the classification of our harvesting waters, the management plans for our shellfish harvesting areas. For example, do you know the management plan for your dad's lease? Um, no, it's not. So no, so the management plan um, has to do with the water body itself. Uh, no. Yeah, all right. Well, I don't want to go into this today, um, but this will be another topic. Um, all the harvesting rules, you didn't attend that one harvester training, so you're not familiar with some of the things that were introduced through yeah. that video, like time taggings is one of them, shading a product, time temperature matrix, all of those. For example, a shellfish farmer cannot sell their product direct to the public. They can only sell to a certified shellfish wholesaler. Then there's a whole set of rules. Okay, then there's a whole set of rules um, pertaining to the wholesaler, certified shellfish wholesaler too. Uh, another um, public health uh, restriction um, is the seed size. For example, for clams, most of the nurseries are located in what's called prohibited or unclassified waters. For you to buy that seed and then put it on your leases that are in open waters, classified waters, the ma maximum size that seed can be is 16 millimeters. So they even have public health requirements pertaining to seed size. Again, from that same comprehensive shellfish control code, a fancy word for rules pertaining to public health, um, this is the state code. There are actually boat requirements for clamming. So Pete, don't look at the answers there. Well, tell me some of the things your dad has to do on his boat to make his boat so he can harvest clams. Oh, gas yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, you got it. So porta potty all the time, no dogs. fuel tanks, no, no dogs, no dogs, fuel tanks have to be isolated. Yeah, yeah, very good. Okay, effective shading to protect the clams. Yep. Then also, as a shellfish farmer, your boat that your vessel that you use, your boat, has to be registered for commercial fishing. And then you enter into a host of requirements by the Coast Guard. Um, for safety equipment that must be on board as it pertains to your PFDs, your, your life jackets, your flotation devices, all of these must meet commercial fishing vessel requirements. In this case, this is what the requirements for a 16 to 26 foot vessel. Yes, yeah, 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 that's for commercial. Yeah, yeah. not on recreational boat. Things like distress signals, fire extinguishers, et cetera, um, also fall under the commercial fishing vessel requirements. All right, so now that we've gotten through that and we had some correct answers, uh, quite a few incorrect answers to some of those questions, um, let's join back with Portia and Charlie and let them have a little bit of discussion as well as let's see if we can go through some of these Q and A's. All right, you are unmuted. So how, how bad did I do? Did I pass or fail? You did great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, I don't know if you want to just start off with a general discussion and about what, what your agency does. I think I kind of went through a lot of that, but... And sure. by the way, I should introduce you, although it says there on the slide, Portia is the Assistant Division Director, and Charlie is, how long have you been with the division? A couple of years now? About a year and a half. 
Yeah, and he's a biological administrator um, for the division. Yeah. Maybe you could start with kind of what y'all do. What what is what do you do? Well, so at the division, um, we have a few programs that we work in. Um, you've already gone out with Mike, so you know about the shellfish harvesting area classification program. So they actually do the water quality sampling, which is then sent to Appalachia and enclose those areas. Uh, we also have the shellfish processing facility program. So anywhere that uh, receives harvested product, we go in and actually visit those for sanitation requirements and to inspect and make sure all their records are, are correct. Um, we have the aquaculture certification program and this would be for leaseholders. And then we also have land-based facilities throughout the state so they could be tropical fish farms, food fish, all types of aquaculture products in Florida. Um, and then finally, the leasing program, which you know you guys are very familiar with. Um, so we help uh, kind of facilitate leasing of state-owned property for aquaculture production, which currently is shellfish, you know, oysters and clams, but in the future may grow to be more than that. So those are the main programs here at the division. Um, Charlie, as a biological administrator, does a lot of outreach and education, um, but also, you know, looking for grants on how we can help develop the aquaculture industry and move forward. Yeah. Add anything? Uh, in terms of my position, yeah, it's keeping up with research and all the different factors of aquaculture, uh, producing the publications and fact sheets you see in front of you, uh, and and uh, as well as uh, administrating the Aquaculture Review Council. So the the department does have an industry-led research organization that has a grant program and I handle the administration of their meetings and uh, setting research priorities. So. I know you did a great job with those um, presentations that are posted on the website and I might mention too that the website is just a wealth of information about not only for shellfish farmers but for anybody interested in going into uh, gator ranching or food fish production tropical fish production. Um, in fact, next week we're going to visit with Gino Evans and talk about food fish and the presentation that we will give before we meet with Gino is the one that you created and is posted um, online. Yeah. Excellent. That's great. I'm glad to hear they're being used. So. They are. They are. Okay. So um, let's go back to, I, I did, you know, sometimes rules and regulations can be kind of boring and I didn't know how to um, make this a little bit more interactive. So we have some question and answers here that I thought the students would be interested in knowing a little bit more about. Um, so I, we go back to the first set of questions and it pertained to the aquaculture certificate program. And Pete, I don't know if you have that page up for the aquaculture certificate Q and A's. So that's your AQ card. You know what it looks like. You know what your dad's, a very nice plastic embossed card and a paper certificate. I don't think anybody ever knows where that is, but they know where their AQ card is. It's in there then that it's carried in everybody's wallet, believe me. Um, so the, when I meant by time period, that question there, so how good, how long is an AQ card for? He doesn't know that, but I suspect y'all might know that. So it runs the fiscal year, which for the state is July 1st through June 30th. So typically in April, we send out renewals for those so everybody can get those in by um, the expiration date for those, which is June 30th. So every year, every year from July 1 through June 30th, and that's the same time frame that the saltwater products license that's administered through the Fish and Wildlife Commission is, it's the same time frame. All right, there is an annual fee for that license. What'd you, what'd you come up with, Pete? Well, he said 50 bucks, but unfortunately we know it's a little bit higher. <laughs> All right, go ahead and answer it. It's $100 a year. Mm -hmm. All right. Is your dad getting a discount? Because he, huh? No, that, okay. Hmm. <laughs> um, can someone other than the leaseholder get an AQ card? 
so Pete said no, he doesn't see why. And so Portia? If you're an authorized user, um, you can get an aquaculture certificate as well. This is a very good addition to this. So this allows folks, you know, you get a lot of folks that work together on a lease or sometimes you have folks informally work on a lease. They don't actually transfer the lease to them or sublease. They, uh, for lack of a better word, we used to call it sharecropping. Mm -hmm. But you would be illegal if you didn't have your AQ card. So your AQ card also identifies you as a farmer. That means you can be transporting undersized seed to your lease. That gives you that right to do so. And that also allows you to um, harvest and sell your product to a certified shellfish wholesaler. So if you're working on somebody's leases, you know, it would be to no avail. You really couldn't farm. So this is a really good provision that allows the shellfish holder to authorize somebody to be on their lease. That then, then they fill out with that authorized user agreement along with the application and also certification that they watch the harvester video and the fee of $100, they can get their own AQ card for that year. But it has to be renewed every year like everybody else as, long, as well as the authorized user agreement. So it's a, that's a really good provision um, um, with that program. So now we're going to move on to the best management practices, and we thought we would ask about some of the BMPs for clam seed. And um, I, I don't think Pete, I, probably I didn't word the questions right, but if you would review some of those um, genetic and health protection um, practices for clam seed that all farmers have to abide by. Sure. So for genetic protection, um, whatever hatchery you're using, whether it's in-state or out-of-state, they have to use Florida brood stock in their genetic selection program, and they have to have that identified on the invoice or on paperwork that you get that they did use Florida brood stock. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so it's just a matter of them saying that um, what we use them in our genetic selection program. And for clams, there's no restriction between, since Florida has two coasts, um, there's no restriction on clam stocks as to where the brood stock comes from. It can come from the Atlantic or Gulf of Mexico coast. That is not the, the same for oysters. And I don't think we're going to get into oysters, but enough to say that there are restrictions on um, oyster stocks in ter terms of which coast. And that has to do not only from genetic um, protection, but actually for um, health or disease protection. And so what are some of those BMPs for? Uh, so the next question was in terms of health protection. Can you get seed from out of state? And if so, what documentation is needed? Right, so Pete said yes, and it has to be from Florida stock, but in addition to genetic protection, Florida has um, health protection, and so if you want to review that, Portia. So anything coming in from out of state, like Pete said, it's got to have that statement about they use Florida brood stock. Um, additionally, they need a certificate of veterinary inspection and diagnostics stating that those animals were tested and that they're clear of QPX for those to come in. And we've kind of changed um, the process for that now. All of those documents are emailed to us beforehand so that we can review them and approve them before the shipment comes into Florida. So, so you can, um, which is a good thing. But again, you have to meet those various provisions. So, you know, hard clams exist all the way from Canada down to Florida, and you can imagine all those different water bodies. Um, there could be some concern for diseases that don't exist in Florida. QPX is one of those diseases. It's a parasite that does exist and has caused a significant crop loss more recently up in uh, off Wellfleet, off uh, Cape Cod. And we certainly do not want to be getting seed from that area 
that um, might introduce that particular pathogen to Florida waters where we do not have it existing currently. So that is to help protect um, our farms. All right, we're going to move on to some best management practices that are related to the clam leases. And um, so what is the term of the lease? So how, how long uh, is the contract between the state and, for example, your dad, Pete, for that lease? And Pete answered a year, and I know, Portia, you're so glad that that does not exist. Yeah. So it's a 10-year term. Yeah, that's a good thing. And by the way, one of the first leases that were let here in 1993, we have now gone through, was, I can't add, <laughs> through to at least two, two renewals, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And that answers the next question, are leases renewable? And that is one of the provisions in the contract that says the leases can be renewed. And that's a very good clause to have. The last thing you want to do is set up a business plan and within 10 years not know if your business exists. Can leases be transferred or subleased? So sublease means that you would temporarily transfer the rights of that lease to somebody else under a contractual agreement between you, the other person, and the state. So he answered yes, um, but, but let, I will let Portia talk a little bit more about that process. Yes, the, the leases can be transferred or subleased. Um, the current lease agreement has a five-year provision for that. So you have to be five years into the lease agreement before you can transfer it or sublease it to somebody else. And um, when someone wants to do that, they just contact our office and we'll draft the documents to do that if it's possible at the time. But then that person will have to follow all the same requirements, you know, get an aquaculture certificate and take the training as well. And then what are the annual clam lease rental fees? Twenty bucks per acre. Close, but pretty close. Twenty six dollars and seventy three cents per acre. Yeah. Yeah. All right, you're close. In other words, pretty cheap. That's pretty cheap to be leasing property to run your business. 26 plus the what's the other base is it ten dollars i never remember yeah it's sixteen dollars and 73 cents per acre and then the surcharge is ten dollars right, per acre. right um all right so within the lease contract with the state there's some special lease uh conditions pertaining to the shellfish farms and we're going to look at those clam special conditions so are clam leases limited to the bottom use only and Pete said yes and if you want to give some little background and what that means and also maybe what it means if you want to grow oysters what you have to do sure um, so the, at the division we don't necessarily say a clam lease versus an oyster lease we'd say bottom versus water column but if you're growing clams we're growing them on the bottom so yes um, and so that bottom lease allows use of up to six inches off the bottom. And then if you want a water column lease, um, if the area has already been approved for modification like Gulf Jackson or Pelican or Dog Island, um, you can just request to the division to modify the aquaculture lease to allow use of the full water column. Um, the lease fees would go up a little bit. Um, those are $43.46 per acre for water column. And then that also brings in the Coast Guard requirements to market pursuant to a Coast Guard private aids to navigation permit, which requires the big three by three lights and the marine lantern on top, just to warn mariners that there may be floating gear in that area. So that's kind of the difference between the two, but it, the water column lease allows use from the bottom to the surface. All right, so can you move wild shellfish stocks to a lease? No, so Pete answered no. Yep, answer. you, get, you get you get your pizza today. Um, <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about that and the implications of what that really means. 
Yeah, so the I believe this is a practice that used to be allowed, maybe not to a lease, but to an area. Um, and the concern is just that that shellfish lease is your leased area that you're growing aquaculture product on. Um, so you're the only one allowed to harvest there, which we've kind of already talked about. So if you go to a public reef and take public resource that's kind of open to everyone to harvest and move it kind of onto your own property, you know, not technically your property, but onto your lease where you're the only one allowed to harvest. It kind of takes that out of the public availability. Um, and the idea with the aquaculture leases is, is that you're planting seed there. So you're not taking from the wild resource, you're actually purchasing shellfish seed and planting it on your lease to grow. Somebody join us? No. no. Okay, so what is the minimum clam cultivation requirement and why do we have a, a requirement for this? And I don't think Pete knows the answer to this. So, okay. So the minimum cultivation requirement for clams is 100,000 per acre planted per year. Per year. Um, so yeah. In Cedar Key, you've got two acre parcels. So that's 200,000 clam seed per year. Um, and the, the reason behind that, and it's in the lease agreement, you know, that you're going to meet those. And also when you renew the lease, um, you fill out what your planting plan is and you're going to meet those minimum requirements. And the idea is these leases were set up for commercial use um, and commercial aquaculture. So using them for personal use or for a hobby um, is not really the, the purpose behind the aquaculture certificate and the aquaculture leases. Um, that's why there's kind of this minimum cultivation requirement, but also, you know, if you've ever gone and checked the maps to see what's available, they're kind of in high demand. So it, every once in a while, the parcels come available, but we wanna make sure that people are working them um, so that they're not just using them or just sitting on these parcels when there are other people that would like to get into the business or would like to expand their business. Oh, okay. So Pete was saying he thought that meant how many clams are you allowed to harvest each day? So. If you are a wild clammer in Indian River, you are limited to how many clams you can dig up. That's a marine resource rule because you want to manage that resource because you're relying upon Mother Nature to seed that and you want to make sure that you can continue and it's sustainable. So now as a clam farmer, you're buying your seed and planting it. So you don't have to meet those minimum excuse me, meet those natural resource requirements. You can harvest as much as you want as long as somebody, a certified shellfish wholesaler is going to buy them. So that's the big difference and that's what the AQ card allows you to do. It identifies your product as a farm product. Okay, so the next question follows up to that um, minimum requirement is what information is required on an annual audit to the department? And I guess you should explain what an audit is and what you're asking of the shellfish grower. Okay, so since we're looking, we've got this minimum cultivation requirement. How do we make sure that the leaseholders are meeting that requirement? So every year they get an audit, um, usually in December, and it's due back by March 1st. And it basically chronicles how much you planted on the lease and how much you harvested on the lease. And then to back up those, um, for what you've planted, you have to provide receipts, again, showing that the stock was Florida brood stock, and if it was imported from out of state, that you've got the health documents to go along with that. And then when you sell your product, um, we'd like to know what dealer you're selling to to make sure that everybody's selling through a certified dealer. Um, so that's the majority of the information collected in the audit. We also ask if you have an authorized user or if you're subleasing, but the, the majority of the questions focus on what did you plant and what did you harvest. So again, remember, as farmers, as shellfish farmers, we're not landowners, we're leaseholders. So we have somebody that we have to answer to, and that is the state of Florida owns that land in which we are farming. And again, it is the Division of Aquaculture's responsibility to make sure that we use it in a way that again shows commercial use and that the various lease conditions are met and that's what the annual audit is about is to verify that you're making that commitment um, through your lease agreement with the state of florida 
And we already answered who is responsible for marking the leaser, leases. Again, it is another requirement of the leaseholder. You marked yours the other day? Yeah, I know. I think um, for a week there, all of those non-compliance letters were the big hit at the local post office. Yep, yep. A lot of people standing in line for those, including me. Um, so, um, all right, moving on. Best management practices for clam leases again. Um, all right, we're going to finish this up with these questions. So what license do you need to sell your clams from your lease to a certified wholesaler? I think we beat that one to death, and um, um, Pete got that right. You need your aquaculture certificate. Mm -hmm. And I should say that when the aquaculture certificate was being developed in statute, um, the recognition that a lot of fishermen were becoming shellfish farmers. Uh, another um, uh, provision that was made that uh, you can maintain your restricted species endorsement under your saltwater products license. I don't know, Pete, if that means anything to you. But here where we have a lot of fishermen also that are clam farmers, they can maintain their RS endorsement with clam sales. You're required to renew that every five years. You can do that now with your clam sales. You just can't earn an RS endorsement with clam sales, but that kind of um, recognizes the, in, the interaction between the fisheries and the amount of fishermen that have become shellfish farmers. Okay. What times can you work on your lease? Boy, we gotta, we got to send Pete home with some better information than what he thinks. Midnight choices, well, <laughs> you might think so around here, but um, no, the answer is no. Um, <laughs> I just can't. <laughs> See the perception that goes on in living in Cedar Key. All right, let's correct Pete real quick. What times can you work on your lease? Sunrise to sunset. Yeah. What times can you harvest oysters from a wild bar? Sunrise to sunset. Yep. Now that's, of course, a natural resource rule under the Fish, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, but it is the same time frame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you see a boat on the lease at night, you automatically know it should not be there. All cultural materials must be free of what? Contaminants was Pete's answer, and that's good. Yep. Um, I'd, I'd stick with the word contaminants, pollutants, um, anything that's going to leach uh, noxic substance into the water. For example, we did run into some problems a few years back about putting various coatings on the clam bags to stiffen the mesh. And to correct a potential situation, um, the Division of Aquaculture set up where they actually um, endorse or uh, excuse me, approve the coatings to be used. So you have a list of approved coatings that can be placed uh, uh, that can be placed excuse me, that your bags can be dipped in, and the manufacturer of that coating has to prov provide information to the division um, about the ingredients in, in that coating. All right, when you're through using cover netting, what do you do with it? Dispose of it properly. In fact, um, so Charlie, you want to talk a little bit about your upcoming workshop? Maybe we might have some of the students join us for that in September. So the, the uh, cover netting is, is a debris issue is, is the main reason we're concerned about it and uh, preventing marine debris around the lease areas is as aquaculture is growing in the state becoming more and more of uh, something that's important. So we are going to be holding a workshop that uh, NOAA's funded us for to talk about uh, best ways to manage the gear on leases and, and that would be floating gear for the oyster farmers and, and clam gear for all the different clam guys and, and particularly cover net which is problematic and can get lost in storms and things like that so we are going to have a workshop and bring in some different folks from out of state to talk about best management practices for managing gear and then options for disposing the gear and then as well we're going to organize a, a, a cedar key area cleanup to, to happen that next saturday on uh, i believe it's uh, world ocean day so. yeah yeah coastal cleanup right 
Um, all right, and the last set of BMPs we want to review in part uh, mechanical harvesting. And I do this because actually Pete and a lot of the um, students as well as farmers here in Cedar Key uh, are not familiar with any need for mechanical harvesting. The bag for clams work very well here and there's not a need to um, uh, use a mechanical harvesting for clam culture with the exception now we do have leases that are suitable for Sunray Venus. And we found that actually some Ray Venus might do much better bottom planting. So the minute you put the seed under a single layer of cover netting, you have to stop and think how you're going to harvest them later. Um, and we also have growers in other parts of the state that actually farm their clams using the method of just a single layer of predator protection netting over the bottom planted seed. Again, then you're forced with just initially Prior, prior to a statute change several years ago, you were then had to use a rake to harvest. That doesn't, you can use a rake, but now you can use a mechanical harvesting, but we need to um, um, define mechanical harvesting. Um, and again, like I said, just a couple of years ago, this was addressed in statute, in law, here in Florida. Um, and one of the ways that could be addressed was because we have these programs in place to make it doable. You can have an AQ card. You can set up through your um, certified facility, your lease, provisions pertaining to mechanical harvesting that you would have to adhere to. So um, I'm going to let Portia then talk a little bit about that and distinguish between those two harvesters. And it's a little complicated mm -hmm. uh, because actually the Hydraulic pump is not considered a mechanical harvester, but right. I'm let you go ahead and define that then. Okay, so in the um, in the lease agreement, all mechanical harvesting devices are prohibited in the general lease agreement. And if somebody wants to use what we would call a mechanical harvesting device, which is defined as a dredge, scrape, rake, drag, or other device towed by a vessel or self-propelled that's used to harvest shellfish. So if you want to use one of those types of devices, uh, you have to approach the division and we actually have to get approval from the Board of Trustees, which is the governor and his cabinet. So it's, it's a process to approve that on a, in the lease agreement and it's specific to that parcel and that contract. Um, the other devices that are not considered mechanical harvesting devices are the handheld, or hand-drawn, hydraulically, or mechanically operated devices used to harvest cultured clams. So like the box harvester or some of the other devices that the clamors have been using, um, per that definition in statute, are not considered to be mechanical harvesting devices. So you don't need special permission to use those. So, uh, yeah, so Rake was always it's not considered to be a mechanical harvester at all and was one of the implements that you could use without any prior approval to harvest um, a hand rake or by hand but again doesn't lead to much um, scale up in terms of your farm it's not very commercially viable um, so with um, this new statute and allowing of a hydraulic um, a driven um, harvester again that facilitates other bivalve species that do much better, maybe by bottom planting, such as the Sunray Venus. And then the mechanical harvester itself, as Portia defined, the dredge or the drag, that's being used by um, the, new oyster the new oyster cultivation efforts that are ongoing that are using cults, for example, um, as opposed to off bottom, it's more on bottom. And that type of tool or implement is very important in terms of working that oyster culture materials that are on the bottom of the lease. So again, um, uh, provisions that were made available to the industry as the industry grows and it has new needs, we're able to address those very proactively. All right, Pete, we've gone through all the Q and A's that I've defined. What, it, what do you have for a question? Well, Pete says that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
All right. So you want to wrap that up, Charlie or Portia? Well, yeah, it's uh, appreciate you sitting in with us, Pete, today, and I hope you got some good information out of this. So it's uh, regulations are certainly not the most thrilling, but it, they're definitely critical to protecting the industry. And so hope you found the session useful. 